next for Palace, sorry, I think. Um, Joanna here is, a, is an activist from SOAS uh, who will be talking for about 10 or 15 minutes on the, on the subject. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, well, first I would like to say I'm not the biggest expert on Palestine, the issue of Palestine, in the sense that uh, you know, I wasn't particularly picked for this because I've been there 20 years of my life or something like that. Um, but, um, but I do do the least politics at SOAS, uh, and thus I hope to uh, provide enough information um, that we can at least start a very interesting debate here. Um, and I, I was reading an interesting article by Robert Fist the other day on The Independent, um, which I thought would be the perfect introduction for this talk, because it was called something like, uh, Democratic governments don't deal with terrorists until they do. Uh, and in it, Fisk pinpoints the exceptional power relation between Israel and Palestine. Um, and uh, because after all, as he argues and I would agree, no other country releases a thousand uh, uh, so-called criminals for the sake of one only of uh, the countries, of their countrymen. And, um, and I thought that's a good way of starting this discussion, because if we're going to ask ourselves, what about Palestine after the UN bid, um, we have to uh, tackle the issue of uh, the huge dis discrepancy between how we as Westerners or how uh, the public, the Western public, uh, conceives the, the question of Israel-Palestine and the conflict between Israel and Palestine, and how Palestinians and uh, middle, the Middle East and the Arab, the so-called Arab world, uh, perceives it. And, um, and in many aspects, this dichotomy is also reflected in the way that uh, the liberal uh, audience uh, analyzes the, the question and how us as revolutionaries uh, do or should do. Um, albeit poorly, what, what Fisk was trying to do with this article was to uh, deconstruct the word terrorist and how it very often is applied when talking about Palestinians and specifically about Palestinian uh, soldiers. After all, when, when, when we're talking about the IDF, the Israeli Defense uh, Forces, nobody ever says the terrorists of the IDF. Perhaps we should, but that's a different issue, and we can go into that afterwards in the discussion. But certainly within the, the, the general mainstream media, nobody does. Um, and this, I would argue, is part of the Zionist rhetoric to demonize Palestinians, um, but uh, it, it's part of, of, of a larger sense of, of our uh, unknowing of, of, the, of the question of... of um, Palestinian emancipatory struggle. Um, this swap that, uh, that Robert Fisk talks about in this article, I'm sure plenty of you have seen, happened, uh, took place ultimately last um, week, or this beginning of this week actually. Uh, and, you know, it truly shows the, 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 the contempt that the Zionist state of Israel takes for, for Palestinian lives. I mean, it was 1,027 1, people for one soldier. Um, so, you know, pretty much saying one Israeli life is worth over a thousand Palestinian lives, almost in, in a sense. And uh, on Tuesday this week, that's when the swap took place. Um, as the Western media, and, and Israeli media as well, if we don't want to consider it Western, um, took plenty of time and cramped pr plenty of pages, pages with images of this, you know, the return of its lost, one lost son, um, Gilad Shalit, uh, once a uh, soldier for the IDF and arrested by um, Hamas in 2005, I think, 2003, something like that. Six? Um, I have a, one of our Palestinian friends wrote from Nablus on Facebook, and I'll, I'll read it because it was quite, uh, I thought it was quite striking. Mum is now flashbacking 1993 with tears when father got released out of the Israeli prisons, wishing this happiness pervades every Palestinian prisoner's house. Uh, and I think this is rather important because it really, uh, highlights the prevailing issue of the anonymity of uh, Palestinians in their emancipatory struggle versus, you know, this one single soldier, but whose name is is pretty much known to to the world um, because of the swap and probably previously to that as well. Because I know there was a whole campaign behind it. As, as a matter of fact, I, I'll just add the information a bit ad hoc here that uh, what Hamas was trying to negotiate was the liberation of uh, female prisoners and uh, underage prisoners. So as a matter of fact, women and children um, in return, but, well, swapping for this one uh, IDF soldier. So I think that's interesting to keep in our minds during the discussion perhaps. Um, my point, however, is that this anonymity of, of Palestinians, and particularly Palestinians who, who 
become incarcerated or, or prisoners or, or die during uh, their struggle is not just due to the Zionist propaganda, but is also due to a failure of political representation in terms of the Palestinian uh, struggle in itself, or the, or the non-representation quasi. Um, and this was most blatant during the recent UN talks on Palestinian statehood. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who is the president of the state of Palestine, who uh, has been holding this position unofficially since 2005, I got this, the dates correctly, um, i.e. he wasn't elected for this position, um, handed to the United Nations a bid for Palestinian statehood recognition back in September. Um, and, uh, but, but despite this, I mean, sort of a token action, he recurrently um, helps silence the Palestinian discontentment over both Israeli and US foreign policies, which we all know why, uh, but also with his own self appointed Okay, as long as it doesn't hit me, don't worry. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so, uh, sorry, I was saying that, yes, um, Abbas and his government recurrently silence uh, the Palestinians' uh, cries for, for, for uh, uh, democracy and certainly for uh, accountability from its own government in, in, um, in Palestine itself. Uh, this was uh, seen during the, I think it was in February, when uh, in Ramallah, especially in Ramallah, plenty of uh, demonstrations were taking place in solidarity with the Tunisian and, uh, and Egyptian revolutions. And uh, through silencing and repression, I don't know if it was physical repression, but certainly through me the media, a lot of uh, media uh, turning the blind eye on this, um, this cry wasn't heard, and it was mostly organized by Fatah, which is the, the, the party that, um, that uh, who's uh, Abbas's leader of. Um, <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, like, as far as I'm concerned, I, I feel that uh, the UN debate showed in less than a month the real interests of you know, both of the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, as well as the hypocrisy of, of Israel and, um, and US foreign policy. The states, on one hand, uh, despite Obama's progressive spiel and uh, the pressure that the Arab Spring has put on um, the US government to shift its uh, Middle Eastern foreign policy, continue to support with all their largest the Zionist project, um, turning a blind eye on an occupation that has been lasting for over 44 years, you know, abstaining from any type of discussion that pertains to the IDF's strike of, um, of Charter of Human Rights. You know, you only need to see how in the US they refer to the apartheid wall, they name it uh, the security barrier or something to that, so some sort of euphemism like that, um, to understand how, how they, they, they really deal with this, which is a very ambiguous and sort of on the, you know, evading everything that is direct questioning on what uh, Israel is, really does uh, in Palestine. Um, <clears throat> and their veto was, was not a shock to, to most, and, and certainly, I think, not to the left. Um, the US needs a permanent mi uh, Middle Eastern base, a uh, proxy, as a matter of fact, especially since the fall of Mubarak's regime in Egypt. Uh, and it won't act in detriment to their relationship with, with Israel, because that's what Israel is very often there for. Um, now, what perhaps is more interesting, or, or you know, more, uh, less criticized by the left often, is the role that Abbas, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, plays within, within the state of Palestine and the emancipation of the Palestinians. Um, because I feel that this bid for a, the, in the UN for a state recognition was mostly for the show. You know, after the bid, he returned to Ramallah with loads of PR hooray, and it was like, hail like a hero. Um, but I feel that what he did was more, or what Fatih is trying to do, is more to appease uh, you know, uh, Palestinian spirits that got very fueled after the, the Arab Spring or during the Arab Spring um, uh, in this sense of democratization and certainly of the descent towards, towards uh, um, Abbas's government. And, uh, and obviously his idea is to continue this you know, sort of compromising tango with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, you know, sort of like doing the whole negotiations and peace talks and whatever else, but keeping things as effectively they are as they are today. And, uh, and to be honest, I wonder how long this, uh, this attempt to refresh Fatah's credibility will last since uh, Abbas is there without uh, any legitimacy, in fact, uh, de facto. And, um, and uh, is that time? No, not me. okay. Um, and as said, he has been trying to silence Palestinians' cries for, uh, for democratization within the, the country itself, or certainly for a, a, an openness that, that there isn't. Um, and I feel that ultimately it all boils down to this. Um, the UN bid for Palestinian statehood recognition 
under, understood Palestine as it current as the current West Bank and uh, Gaza Strip regions, or what is currently called the Palestinian Authority of the PA. So um, I think the borders are from fifty something after four, after forty eight. Um, but the PA's borders, however, are currently abused and trespassed by IDF and Israeli settlers, with the support of an increasingly right-wing Knesset, the Israeli uh, government, uh, parliament, um, and use and have exclusive control of over 11% of Palestinian territory between these theoretical borders and the apartheid wall. And I guess I don't have to explain the repercussions of you know, such imperialist expansionist acts because obviously it has a huge impact on, um, on the Palestinian economy, um, because this also means that um, both IDF and particularly settlers have most of the control over, I think it's 30% of the main water resources in the West Bank, uh, and alongside uh, plenty of, of um, arable land uh, resources, which means that it has a huge impact on the agriculture of uh, the West Bank, which again is one of the main um, sources wealth and income for Palestinians uh, in the West Bank. Um, <clears throat> and any talks of Palestinian statehood, by which it means independence, in fact, or in effect, must take these issues into consideration. So it, they must revoke things uh, like, you know, the apartheid wall, the Israeli Zionist settlements, um, you know, they have to demand the right for return of Palestinian refugees, both in the West Bank, Gaza, but also across the uh, Palestinian uh, diaspora, etc. And uh, as you might imagine, such demands are not concomitant with the Zionist project uh, and will therefore never be reached through any UN talks or peace talks or whatever they want to call it, uh, bureaucratic, politicking and backdoor deals. Uh, the only way of reaching Palestinian emancipation is through the streets and by this I mean both the streets of Jerusalem and New York and London and Damascus but also through the streets of Ramallah and, and Nablus and Hebron and wherever else uh, in, in the West Bank or Gaza. Um, <clears throat> the PA's legitimate government and its leader, Mahmoud Abbas, who, look the mo who looks the more like a Palestinian version of uh, Ben Ali at this, at this rate, need to be overthrown and replaced not by a similar Hamas version, i.e. a bourgeois system obeying politicos and their little minions, but by the Palestinians themselves and, and the will of the people. And it is clear that only such a revolution uh, that would invert the current Palestinian power structures uh, the democratization of the, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, and the PLO, the implementing of a large political participation from below, from below in some a socialist revolution, as, as we define it, can, uh, can, is the only way of truly opening uh, the possibility for Palestinian liberation, per se. Um, and only such a process in such a state that won't compromise to the impossibility of a two-state solution, uh, but fight for a democratic, secular worker state, where Hebrew and Arabic speakers, or you know, Jews, Muslims, and Christians uh, live together in peace under economic or in the collective control of the economy and for well-being of all can truly uh, lead to uh, Palestinian emancipation. Now I hope I can open up to discussion because I'm pretty sure I said plenty of controversial points where I touched upon them. Um, so I'll leave it as such for here for me, um, but I'm more than happy to answer questions. Thank you, John.